Okay, good uh, Good morning to everybody in Los Angeles. Uh, good evening to everybody in Northern Ireland, on the island of Ireland, uh, and, and to everybody who is joining us uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I am Connor Houston and I have the honour of being the visiting fellow of Irish Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and you're joining us uh, today for a truly special event and um, there is another event happening simultaneously at the same time. Uh, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, is addressing both houses of the Oireachtas, the Irish Parliament in Dublin, um, uh, which, is, which is a great uh, symbol of, of the uh, powerful and enduring relationship between Ireland and the United States. But I think it's, it's fitting that at the same time as he is doing that, uh, young people from uh, Ireland, across the island of Ireland, from Northern Ireland, and uh, in Los Angeles in the United States are coming together to talk about uh, the future. Uh, and uh, I, I had the privilege yesterday, uh, and I know that Tara Grace, who's on this call, who you'll hear from later, was also there. We had the privilege of uh, being at the, and Luke was there as well, the address uh, by President Biden when he came to Belfast to Ulster University yesterday. And I thought that it was particularly poignant and powerful that the focus of the president's speech and I think who he wanted to speak most to was to the young people of Northern Ireland and a lot of his remarks and a lot of those who were there as epitomized by Tara Grace and Luke were, were, our, uh, were our leaders, our young leaders and uh, that was really really powerful so um, I suppose this is just we couldn't have picked a better time to have this conversation as uh, President Biden is here on the island of Ireland uh, and we are marking the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement this week and um, on Tuesday of this week uh, as part of the, the, the university's um, work to commemorate and celebrate the agreement uh, I was joined in conversation with the former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern, the former Irish Prime Minister Bertie Ahern, and we had a wonderful conversation reflecting on uh, his memories of the agreement, the lessons of the agreement, and I suppose very much looking to the future as to what's next. And I think what both um, the former Taoiseach and myself agreed on is it's the people on this screen, it's the people you're going to hear from this evening that all of our energies and all of our work are about. The people on this screen represent the, the, what the next 25 years of our agreement is about. It's their hopes, it's their visions, it's their ideas. They're going to shape the future of Northern Ireland, of the island of Ireland, and of the relationships between the United States and, um, and the island of Ireland. I am very grateful to, uh, LMU for all the work in, in bringing this event together uh, to the Director of Irish Studies, uh, Dermot Ryan, but of, of course tonight to two wonderful friends uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, Jennifer Mara, uh, Ramos and uh, Mara Ford, and I'm very, very grateful to you for not only making tonight happen, but for those of you uh, who haven't come across uh, Jennifer and Mara before, they have been long-standing friends uh, of Belfast, of Northern Ireland, having brought students here for many, many years. And in fact, uh, I met them at the very beginning of my journey with LMU about six, seven years ago when I was asked to meet a group of students visiting Belfast. And never did I imagine that I would have the opportunity to, I think, travel to Los Angeles now six or seven times since then and, and have the privilege of being the inaugural chair of Irish Studies. So thank you Jennifer and Mara for all your, your help and, and support and for everything you do for building relationships between Los Angeles and, and particularly here in Belfast. Um, so look, I, I this is not about hearing from me tonight. Uh, I am really here to facilitate and convene. Uh, on this screen we have uh, I, I've, I've never liked the term future leaders because it suggests that they're not leaders right now. The people on this screen are leaders right now. They are shaping things. They are making change happen. Uh, and uh, knowing the, uh, as it were, the, the contingent from this side of the water, I'm exceptionally proud of what each and every one of them is doing day in, day out to advance the, 
the cause of peace here and also the cause of prosperity. So what I'm going to, to do is um, I'm going to start with our uh, delegation in Los Angeles and we're very grateful to you for coming and I understand that those who are on the call from LA uh, were recently in Northern Ireland so I thought to start the conversation this evening what would be great is to hear from you on what your impressions were and your observations were from your uh, from your recent visit here to to Northern Ireland so um, I, I, I'll not pick on people uh, but if, if, if one of you wants to jump in so one of the LA uh, LMU students if you want to come in first and then we'll, we'll we'll jump to this side of the Atlantic and hear from some of the young people here so who wants to come in first about your, your perspective uh, what you thought when you were here I can go. Hi, Caroline. Thank you. Hi. So, um, yeah, we were in Northern Ireland probably a month ago now, and um, it was only my second time out of the country, so I didn't really have many expectations, but Belfast was such a beautiful place, um, very small city time. We were able to walk the city multiple times in its entirety, so that was really interesting to see. Um, I think the thing that caught me most off guard was that the walls are still up and you have to be on a certain side of the wall past 4 or 10 p.m. Um, so that was super interesting and just seeing the different um, political graffiti on both sides of the wall was also really interesting because um, again we don't really have that here. We have um, not as much of people's opinions on on the walls here so that was that was really interesting. Caroline, yeah, it's it's a bit of a smaller city than Los Angeles. Uh, you can walk from one end to the other quite easily. I'm, I'm not sure if it would be possible to walk from one end to, to, of LA to the other, uh, never mind drive from one end to the other. So, uh, who, so who else is from? Uh, Miley or Luna, do you want to come in and share your reflections? Um, I can. Um... I was uh, greeted very well by Belfast. Uh, everyone there is so nice. Uh, definitely not what the average European city is like. Uh, so I really like that. Um, I think regarding, you know, just peace in general and re reconciliation there, I was most taken aback by the Women's Center on Shankill. I thought that was super impactful. And the work that they do to me um, is more reconciliation than writing things on paper. Um, so I was really, really surprised by the work they did there. And it's not all regarding, you know, um, peace. They took classes for like um, healthcare or they took classes of sign language, which I think, although it's not, you know, directly correlated with like, oh, let's like come together politically, you come together in different forms, you know, through motherhood, through being a woman, um, through learning sign language. And I think that brings people together, even if they have differences in their backgrounds or in their history. So yeah, that was to me the most impactful experience. Thanks, thanks Luna. And as someone who has had the privilege of being in the Shankar Women's Center many times, I can uh, agree with you. They do remarkable work in empowerment and uh, empowering women empowering communities and uh, as I always say if you want something done go and ask uh, the woman and they will tell you what needs done they will tell you how to do it and they will get it done so um, people like Eileen Weir at the Shanghai Women's Centre are, are, are our ultimate peace builders and, and real life superheroes as I say so I'm, I'm delighted that you reference them. Miley or uh, Luke did you want to come in with your reflections? So I'm actually at Queen's and I live sorry, in Belfast. Sorry, I guess you're one of our quick. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, that. Apologies. <laughs> I'll bring you in a second, by Sorry, Luke. Let me jump to you. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, just to add on to what Luna said, I thought that the Women's Center was really uh, powerful to see because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the the person who runs his name is Eileen, and one thing she brought up to us was um, she's trying to find someone eventually to replace her, and she said that's just a really difficult thing to do because she's trying to find someone who's passionate and um, will stay there and like work through 
and and hear all of her teachings, but like it's hard to find someone, especially if they didn't live through the troubles like she did, um, who's gonna understand really uh, the gravity of like how important it is to um, work with the community there and for a better future. So I thought that was a really powerful place to go visit. Sure. So how we pass the baton to the next generation is, yeah. is a big, big issue. I think it's something we'll we'll talk about this evening. Um. So maybe I, I, I Cambria or Maxwell. I think. Are they... Yeah, I can take yeah. this one. Oh, here. Oh, you want to go? No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah. Um, having um come from LA, uh, it's really surprising how safe um you really feel in Belfast. Um, even though there is a um, underlying um, an undercurrent of violence going on um, uh, largely uh, it, it really feels uh, like a safe place and uh, it was interesting to be able to hear the perspectives of the people there um, particularly around the trust in the authorities and how that's moved over time um, all in all it was a really good experience that gave me a uh, different perspective on the conflict that happened there thanks thanks Maxwell Sorry, Cambria, I think you were about to come in there. Sorry. Yeah, I'll jump in now. <laughs> um, everyone has brought up like the main highlights of our trip. Um, I would just add that the problem that Eileen brought up was such an interesting conversation about trying to find someone that's going to take over this peace building process because she was describing it as difficult and it would need so many years to teach, you know, the connections. Um, what exactly is the peace process between you know one area region and another and how do you teach that to someone in the years I mean it would take she said at least five years but it's almost like there's this in-between stage she said I think um something like because my generation is not dead yet, we still do need someone to be participating in these peace processes. So kind of alluding to that fact that the younger generation is perhaps in a different, has a different lens of what the conflict was. So that really stuck out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's a great bridge to, to bring in our uh, some of our friends uh, on this side of the Atlantic. And you know, one of the remarkable things uh, of, of all the young people and I still like to think I'm young but I'm, I'm, I'm sadly sadly not anymore but of the young people who are here from from Belfast from Northern Ireland uh, on this call I think it's right to say that nearly all of them were, were not will were not will have no memory uh, I were born after uh, the Good Friday Agreement which is for me very strict because I was a teenager and it was such a seminal moment it was such a huge it was one of the biggest things that happened uh, during my sort of childhood years was watching the, the agreement uh, come about so I suppose that's maybe a good way of, of, of starting the conversation and um, maybe we could go um, we have two alleys on the call so maybe we'll, we'll go to the alleys first and you can Pick which other you go for, you know, just to maybe give you a perspective. We're talking about this 25th anniversary of the peace agreement. It's, it's obviously why President Biden came here. The United States has played a huge role in 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 supporting the peace process and advocating for the agreement. So, so it would just be interesting. What 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 does the 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 agreement mean to you? And do you think to your generation? And we'll we'll go around to your your uh, your colleagues in a second. But so maybe. Ellie, Joe, do you want to go first and then we'll, we'll go to the other? Yeah, I'll go on first, targeted because I'm an Ellie. <laughs> um, but um, I'm from Derry. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen Derry Gare. It's like, that's back in America, but that is like my few knowledge of America. You but, are a Derry Gare. <laughs> Derry Gare, of course. <laughs> um, any comments on the TV show directed to me. Um, but yeah, the Good Friday Agreement. I was born in 2004, so I am well into being a peace baby, like whatever that term is, but... I think whenever I think about the agreement, I, I of course like look at the non-violence that it's brought and like the actual like ability to grow up and be safe in my community. And that's something that my parents didn't experience. You know, like I come from a very working class background in Derry and my parents grew up the exact same way. So their experience growing up in the troubles was like hugely different maybe than somebody in other parts of even Northern Ireland and of course in other countries. So I've kind of grown up with an appreciation of that, um, but also the understanding of like the unique perspective that gives me. So my parents, you know, I, everybody talks about the troubles here, um, maybe not as much as we should um, in terms of learning from it. 
but from my parents I would have you know heard a lot of their own stories and that's obviously used my own opinions but to me it's mostly about like this opportunity that we were given I don't know if we're fully utilizing it right now but it, it was just opportunity and that ability for us to kind of overcome our past but not completely ignore it um and I don't know I think um maybe to like start the conversation off I will say what I believe the Good Friday Agreement to be um I don't think that it was just like the end of the troubles I actually think it was meant to be the start of something new um and maybe we need to really get back and look at it, at it that way and um hopefully a government for Christmas <laughs> um but yeah that's my GFA reflections Okay, well, thank you, Ali Chirpland. I love that sense of opportunity that, that we've all been given, how we realise it. I'll go to the other Ali, and then I'm going to come to, to Joel um, to, to get his um, I am I am also from Derry. <laughs> You've got two Ali's from Derry on the call right now, so it's a bit confusing. But, yeah, I've had a kind of similar experience as Ali Joe. Like, my parents growing up would always tell me stories about it was normal for them to have a bomb scare, like, on the way to school or just be walking about and be told road clothes, like all this is going on. Whereas for us now, that's so unheard of, thankfully so. But it just shows you the, the difference in experiences and how important it is to keep that peace and, and to stop it from going back to something like that. I think one of the main kind of differences, and this kind of goes off what Ellie was saying about opportunity, but you know, nowadays, like, if I was to go and meet someone from a different community, there'd be no problems. It would be seen as normal. I have that. I have that chance to do that. Whereas it, going back only 30, 30 years, if you were to, there'd be a certain attitude there. If you were saying, oh, I've reached out, because it's almost as though stepping outside of your comfort zone. It's in a place like this, which has always been quite divisive, especially before the Good Friday Agreement. I think people were very stuck in the kind of safety net of their own communities and they felt as though anyone stepping outside of that was it was very risky um, and then that just stood as a barrier to peace and the only way that peace came about was those individuals like John Newman, David Trimble who kind of reached out the hand of friendship and they took that step forward and they really set the example for the rest of us to follow um, and I think that going forward that is something that we need to maintain we need to make sure that we are reaching out that hand of friendship um, all the time and that we're not sticking to our own kind of backgrounds and our own communities because that is something that in the past has prevented us from going forward. So I do think that as far as the future is concerned, you know, we need our governments as well to set the example and they need to reach out the hand of friendship and get back into power and get back into working for the good of everyone here. Um, and hopefully, you know, when that happens, but the future will only bring more of that, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. That's, that, that's great. And speaking of hand of friendship, um, I, I, I'll go over to someone who's become a good friend uh, through lots of great conversations and particularly conversations about disagreeing well. Um, so, Joel, do you want to maybe give your reflections on the what you feel about the Belfast Good Friday Agreement? Uh. Yep. Um, first of all, just quickly apologise. There are a group of kids out that window uh, playing. So if you hear a scream, it's not because anyone's being stabbed or anything. It's just uh, just people having fun. Um, the Good Friday Agreement is an interesting one. Um, I think we should separate the Good Friday Agreement from the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement. So if we're going to talk about the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement, it was one that sought to... Um, end violence. It was one that sought to save lives. It was one filled with optimism. Um, it was taking on the impossible. It was bringing an end to a decades-long divide. And I support that fully, and I think that that's great. Um, but it was actually, Tara, I think I was reading a post from you earlier, uh, which I totally agree with, um, in that just because the Good Friday Agreement may have done the impossible, it may have stopped the bombs and the bullets, I don't think that means that we should shy away from criticizing the elements of it that have maybe even, I mean, you could argue have led to the problems that we're seeing today now. Um, I think that the Good Friday Agreement was put in place and it maybe was a relief for a lot of people. It was like a big weight had lifted off your shoulders. You no longer had to worry about your school bus exploding on the way to school. But did the war end? Did the ideological war end? Now, I don't know if if maybe people growing up in different communities feel differently, but certainly growing up in a loyalist or from a loyalist background, 
um, in, a, in a loyalist area. It never really felt to me like the 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 war was over. You know, we were kind of we were kind of told, and, and whenever I say told, it's not that we were all pulled into a room and told you watch out for them Catholics. It was. It's all very complicated. It's a series of trauma. You know, you might have someone whose family might have been murdered by the other side or someone who had been involved in the conflict. And so there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of emotion going on. And maybe whenever they're talking about different groups of people, some of that kind of rubs off onto you. And so what I have had to try and do in the last few years of my life is kind of filter through all that and work out, okay, what what is my opinions and what are the opinions that I've been given? And I've been trying really, really hard and making a real effort to try and kind of sift through these things. And and I find it to be a, a really fulfilling experience um, because I have met people like Tara, like Connor, and um, like Luke. I see a few of you that I've met before. And it's been great because what I find was a lot of the assumptions that I had about the other side was incorrect, was just wrong. It was just um, things that I had either come up with in my own head or I had been told by someone else. Um. And it was that process of actively challenging myself and actively putting myself in situations that I had been advised and told to avoid that has helped me kind of achieve this new perspective on things. And I think the Good Friday Agreement would have been a great opportunity to start a real societal push for everyone to adopt that kind of mentality. And But I think that maybe that part of it fell short. I don't think that there was a real societal push for a real mind shift or a mindset shift. Uh, among people. I think maybe there was an element of, we're just glad that the violence has ended. We're glad that we no longer feel um, at threat walking through our city centre. And maybe there was, um, you know, complacency. Maybe there was people who who didn't want to push too far. You know, they, they, we got this agreement, we achieved the impossible. And I think it feels to me, looking back very much that, like even in school, you know, we were never taught about the any any of the history of the troubles. We were told it happened. But I think from the, even the teacher's perspective, they don't want to risk, you know, giving you a biased perspective on history. And so in my case, what they tended to do was just avoid it. And so there was never, we never addressed these difficult conversations that I think we, we have to address if we if we want to move forward as a society. And so to sum it all up, you know, I think the Good Friday Agreement was great. It stopped the violence and it was a, it was a great first step. But unfortunately, on its own, I, I think we can see nowadays it's it, it's unfortunately leading to some more problems. What we really need to do is go back to the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement and, and have a think about where are we going from now? Because what's clear to me, and, and I don't know if you'll disagree or agree, but what's clear to me is that the way we've been doing things um, since the Good Friday Agreement, it's simply unsustainable. We've had two collapsed governments. We've had all sorts of scandals and things and and our politics is very bitter and it's very um dirty here, I would say. You know, it's not um it's not one of class, it's not one of respect, it's not one of civility. And I think it should be. Um so yeah, the Good Friday Agreement, grateful for it. I'm very grateful that it's allowed me to live a, a life of relative peace. Um what I would like to see going forward is a real kind of mind mindset, a push to have people's mindsets shifted. Um, from one of bitterness and fear and anxiety, um, which may be founded in le from legitimate places, um, to one of optimism and hope and creativity and, and and vision. And what do you want for your country? You know, I want a country of values. I want a country of respect. I want a country that anyone in the world can be can be proud to come to. Um, so those are my thoughts. Here, yeah, yeah, Joel, and thank you for for your passion as always. And and I think one of the things Joel talks about there, which is hugely important is that if we've learned something in the last 25 years creating the peace agreement is almost the easy part and creating institutions and saying you're going to have this form of government and, and that form of government nearly seems to be the easy part there's what joel is, is, is brilliantly articulating there is the hard work of peace building is changing attitudes changing the hearts and minds of people people reaching out the hand of friendship as joel said people being prepared to take risks. That's the really hard part of peace process. That's the pit that 25 years on, we still haven't got quite right and we still have a lot of work to do. So I think, I think Joe, that that's a really important uh, observation and, and, and also an approach to how we're going to solve it because it's in having conversations, it's in reaching out and it's in building relationships, which you do every day, that we will solve these problems. I'm gonna bring in, so, Miley, I think you and and also um, Francis, maybe I, I think um, right you met with the the delegation, but they were here. So it'd be great to just have uh, go to you first, Miley, and then go to you, Francis, just to get your perspectives because you're kind of 
to your own reflections, but also just because you, you had the opportunity to meet with the, with the guys from LA when they were here last month. About the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. Okay. So for a bit of context, I'm doing my PhD and my project is the political identities of the Good Friday Agreement generation. So interviewing people who might be on this call about uh, their identities and how they feel post-Brexit and all that stuff. So the Good Friday Agreement is something that I'm kind of living and breathing right now. Um, so I am very, very aware of my positionality as an American and America's role in the Good Friday Agreement and also American conceptions and misconceptions about the peace agreement um, and things. So I think what I really, really enjoy about the opportunity to talk to fellow Americans, like when this group came and we and we got to have a chat, is that um, there is investment. I know Joe Biden said yesterday, like, America cares. Um, but also, I really appreciated that he also took the time to talk to the political leaders and say, I'm not here to interfere with your government. That's not the role of America. We never were here to come in and tell you what to do. But as a support, um, because my life is in Belfast now, I've lived here for three years. My husband works here. Um, we're part of all these different communities. I'm very invested in Belfast. I'm part of several different nonprofit peace organizations, and I'm here to learn. And I'm here to learn from people who are here. And what I'm hearing from people our age and older people is that there's there's this duality with the Good Friday Agreement. Thank goodness there's no more peace, but it failed us politically. It's just the consistent over and over. Like, yes, I didn't have to grow up the way my parents and grandparents did, but they have the audacity to dream for a normal democracy, you know, to see, like they see the way that Scotland and Wales and England and also, you know, the US for all of our divisions and all of our problems, we still have a functioning democratic government, right? And so um, I think that's something that has really struck me about these young people is, you know, there is this hunger and this desire to not just put the Good Friday Agreement on the shelf and say, look at this, look at what we did, but to actually use it as the toolkit that it's meant to be and to improve it going forward. Thank you, Miley, for that. And I'm so glad you've, you've made uh, this, this wonderful part of the world your home. So it's, it's great. Um, Francis, maybe bring you in uh, and then we'll go to, uh, to Luke, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, so like Miley, I am in my third year of my PhD. Miley and I spend a lot of time together. We share an office and now we're best friends. So, uh, but similar to her, um, I am not from Northern Ireland. If you can't tell by my very posh accent, I'm English. I grew up in the Midlands. Um, my mum is from an Irish Catholic background, but really like it's tenuous and it didn't really make um, much of a, a point when I was younger. Um, similar to Miley, I have basically spent all of my adult life in Northern Ireland. I had a year out um, doing my master's in Scotland and a year in working in London. But otherwise, uh, Belfast in particular is my home um, and it has been for nearly sort of 10 years. Um, and what my work really looks at is kind of um, this shift of having grown up in England and then spending my adult life in Northern Ireland. I've very much seen both sides of it. Um, I know other people said they didn't learn about the Troubles or the Good Friday Agreement at school. We definitely didn't in England, but also we hadn't really heard of them. I think I got to year 12 and we started uh, studying uh, some of Yeats's poetry. And it was only then I heard about the Easter Rising. Um, I think at that point, that's when I realized Northern Ireland was a country and that Ireland uh, was partitioned. Um, so my work really looks at like British engagement with the Good Friday Agreement. And I think if we're going to talk about the Good Friday Agreement and what it means now, 25 years on, I guess my biggest takeaway is that, and this comes through from my interviews with conservative politicians in particular, um, there's this very much attitude of 1998 Good Friday Agreement done. Um, and that's kind of like problem solved. Whereas that's a completely wrong way to look at it. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement is a framework for managing Northern Ireland and these competing identities. And definitely the main thing my work focuses on, I mean, I know other people have picked out sort of intra and inter-community issues. And there's definitely like huge issues in working class communities as well. But um, my particular focus is that like that sustained British engagement hasn't really been there since 1998 for helping manage the Good Friday Agreement. Um, Brexit definitely exposed it, but I wouldn't say it was the cause of that. Um, but then the other part of me 
wants to be an optimist and I kind of my master's was in peace and conflict studies which I know a lot of the Americans who I um, enjoyed meeting last month are also studying these issues and look peace is really hard 25 years is a long time and it's also frustrating but equally these things didn't happen in 25 years to create the divisions that exist there and therefore they're not going to be solved in 25 years and you have to kind of maintain the positivity I guess but yes thank you Francis for those uh, reflections and um I can empathize. I, I, I was born here, but grew up in the south of England uh, most of my childhood. So I came back in the mid 90s, just before the agreement, uh, with a very strong English accent and went to Catholic school in Belfast. And I felt like James in Dairy Girls, uh, the wee English fella, where I had to explain myself the whole time as to why I had an English accent and yet was a, came from a Catholic uh, background. Um, and in many ways, part of the privilege of growing up here as a teenager. Uh, was was figuring things out for myself. So uh, you, you you do get to have different perspectives on things. Thanks for sharing that, Luke. I'm going to come to you now for your reflections um, as as one of our uh, young leaders here at the moment uh, in in terms of what your your thoughts on where we're at and and your thoughts maybe and particularly given that you were uh, front and center with President Biden yesterday as well. Thanks, Tonner, and uh, thank you very much for the invite. <clears throat> it's been really lovely listening to everybody's understandings and experiences of, of, of visiting Northern Ireland. And the one thing that I'm sure that unites all of us here is that we love welcoming everyone to Northern Ireland. It's a fantastic place to come, as you know, and if you ever want to come back, you know where we are. Northern Ireland for me is home. I am part of the 17,000 young people that leave Northern Ireland every September to go to university in England, Scotland or Wales. And uh, I'm back home now for the Easter holidays. And that is a huge number of people. And living half the year in Northern Ireland, half the year um, in, in sunny Cambridge, uh, I, I've come to understand just what this place means to me and it's not just the rainy weather uh, and, and the cold weather it's the people that make Northern Ireland first and foremost and all of the Northern Irish people on this call I've had the privilege to meet and work with in different guises and different organizations and despite us all coming from different political backgrounds we have a shared cause of making this place that we call home no matter what we call it, no matter what we want the long-term constitutional question to be a better place. And um, I mean, what people have been touching upon has been absolutely right. The Great Friday Agreement was the start of a process. It wasn't uh, an accord that was finished at the time. It was a peace uh, process. And that process 25 years on is still needed more than ever. We've come a long way, but we haven't come far enough. Northern Ireland, uh, the GDP is still much less than the rest of the UK and Ireland. Uh, mental health uh, is a huge issue. Um, the biggest killer of men aged under 49 is suicide. We've had more people die from suicide after um, the Troubles than died during the Troubles. We are a divided society, but we're not a, a, a country, a nation made up of different communities. We are one community and uh, we have different political opinions. I'm active in politics and I represent the Trust Community Alliance Party. And we have seen a rise in the support for us over the last few years. And what that's shown is that the Good Friday Agreement needs to evolve with society. There was a clause in the Good Friday Agreement which is conveniently forgotten. There's lots of stuff in the agreement that's conveniently forgotten. But one thing that is, is that after five years, it was going to be reviewed after the first assembly. 25 years on from the signing of the agreement, that hasn't happened. And society has changed. We're not a society of green and orange. We're a society of technicolor. And it is fantastic. We have a flourishing multicultural society, people from all over the world, people of different uh, sexualities feeling able to express themselves in a way that they weren't just a few years ago. And the agreement needs to catch up with that. The agreement um, institutionalized the divide in Northern Ireland between nationalists and unionists. 25 years on, only 8% of our children are educated together. 
the uh, religion or political background that you have ensures that you go to a certain school, that you play certain sports, that you meet certain people, that even when you would try a hospital treatment, you go to a certain hospital. Um, we need to move on from those times and it's opportunities like these where we can discuss um, ideas to move on from that, which I, I'm really grateful to take part in. So thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. And I think Luke brilliantly captures a sense of optimism and hope that your generation uh, have for the future. And I absolutely agree with you, Luke, that I think one of the remarkable transformations and your right to identify there are things that need reform, there are things that need to change, but you capture brilliantly that sense of, I think we all now understand that wherever we're going, we're going there together because this is our home and, and, and that we need to focus more and more on that. Um, I'm going to go to Tara Grace um, now, who was also, uh, I think, front row uh, at the Biden event yesterday. I spotted you, Tara Grace. So, Hi. Um, I think I'm going last. Um, an unenviable task. And also, I'm very sorry if my voice sounds funny. I have an ear infection and I have drops in. So I'm making weird faces and I can feel them like all popping in my ear. So I apologize in advance if I sound a bit weird. Um, yeah, uh, very difficult to go last after listening to that panel of people. Although something I think I can point out is uh, of the Northern young people here, I think I'm the oldest and I'm the only one born pre-98. I was born six months before the agreement in October 97. Um, so technically um, I was pre-98, but I'm, I'm very much... 25 years old, peace baby, the exact same age as the agreement. Um, yeah, so my reflections on the Good Friday Agreement and my thoughts on it. I kind of want to go back to Joel. Um, I always find Joel and I, it's very interesting um, as a relationship. Joel and I come from technically different sides of the fence and you'd always end up saying or thinking the same kind of thing. <laughs> um, uh, and think maybe that's why we, we get along well. Um, not that I don't get along well with the rest of them. I know a lot of the rest of you and these are all wonderful as well. But Joel really kind of touched on something about that thing of the spirit of the agreement. And I think the fact that Joel and I can even sort of support each other on Twitter and, and talk in person kind of is the spirit of the agreement in real life. That That is it. That's the thing. Being able to talk to each other and see each other as a person and not a political identity. Um, a bit about my background. I'm from a very working class nationalist area. Um up there with Derry, one of the, the places hard hit by the conflict and from born to parents um, who were 18 at the time of the hunger strikes um, were very much uh, forged in, in the conflict and forged in the troubles and in sectarianism. Um, but I was very lucky to have parents that didn't want that for me and didn't want that to be my life. And so have encouraged me to reach out to other people and encourage me to get involved in trying to make the place where I live a little bit better. Um, I think if you had told me at 18 that I would have stayed in Belfast to go to university, I would have laughed at you. I thought I would have been one of the 17,000 um, like Luke that left for, for different shores. But by circumstance, by by fluke, basically, by, by good fortune, I happened to stay. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, it's very discouraging. Um, looking at politics at times, you can look at all on all the unfulfilled promises of the agreement, no civic forum, no bill of rights, no reviews, collapse of the institutions, and unfortunately institutions that with the best of intentions were formed to encourage diversity and encourage co-working that have unfortunately been sort of co-opted and, and warped out of their original intentions and have become actually the enforcers of division instead of bringing people together. Um, while that is discouraging and while the, the rates of mental health that Luke referred to is discouraging and the brain drain and her housing and all the issues that you see at home, something that does seem to always come through is the good crack in the spirit of the people that live there. Um, and there was a really interesting comment that I heard recently and it's always sort of said in different in different ways, but that the politics takes a long time to catch up to the people. Um, and I think the people, by and large, the vast majority of people at home do want better. Um, it isn't just our generation. I think our parents want better for us now. Um, I think grandparents are wanting better. Um, and I think it is about time that our institutions and our politics are playing catch up um, to where the people are already at. And something really key about home moving forward is not that we all become nationalist, all become unionists, or all become others like Luke. 
it's to create a place where all of those identities can live side by side equally and along with all the emerging identities that are coming like even even something like you hear Miley and Francis who are living in Belfast and consider their home as well I don't think their lives should be defined by a conflict between certain sections of society either um so there's a lot to be discouraged about but I think the caliber of people and how people from all over the world can come to Belfast or Derry or wherever they want to go don't know if anyone wants to go to Tyrone or Enniskillen but that's <laughs> there's no one here to, to, to uh, refute me but uh anyone from all over the world can come here and comment on how at home they are made to feel I just want our own people to be made to feel at home as well I think we deserve that much so as I said very unenviable task to go last um a lot of the points have been said so that that's kind of me that's that's my thoughts well thank you Tara Grace for sharing them as as passionately and as brilliantly as you always do so uh look that was uh a tonic I think for anybody that's listening I'm, I'm sitting like with a natural smile on my face going you know it just gives me such a sense of hope and I'm sure everybody that's listening to this uh, will feel the same and we're so fortunate to have these these minds and these these brilliant people uh, investing in the future of this place and I suppose what I want to do in the final sort of section of, of this where we, we will uh, based on the sea, I think definitely be convening again soon because there's so many issues we could, we could be discussing together. But I remember a number of years ago when I was probably the age of, of most of you uh, and was really young, um, that I had the privilege of being at an event one evening with the then US ambassador, a man called Kevin O'Malley. And Kevin O'Malley said something that I've always remembered and he said, I'm going to tell you a secret. He said, one day you'll be in charge. He said, but the big thing they won't tell you is that you are in charge. He said, it will just happen. And uh, as, as someone who uh, I, like Luke has found myself in political life, you know, I sometimes go, I can't, who's in charge? And you just go, well, well, am I in charge? Or is, is such and such in charge? Or, and what you start to realize you get older is, well, in some ways, nobody's in charge. And it's about who steps up to be the leader, who steps up to lead people, who steps up to champion. And every single person on this call is already a leader in that regard. Um, you just maybe don't realize it yet. You are in charge. So in that theme, if you are in charge right now, and we're looking to the future and thinking of the United States. You have a very interesting time coming up as you're about to mark the 250th anniversary of your country. We will look to the next 25 years of uh, our, our peace agreement and where we might be in 50 years. So uh, the question I sort of will just go around um, sort of uh, as quick as we can and, and feel free to jump in. I, I want to make sure we just brought everybody in. That's why I went around very deliberately. This time I'm gonna be a bit more free for all. Maybe um, you could reflect on, if you're in charge right now, what is it you'd like to do? What is the thing you'd like to change? What's, what is, uh, I always love the Americans of a great, so what does success look like? What does success look like? Whether that be here in terms of, uh, you know, the next phase of our peace process or uh, in the United States, how you see the United States evolving. So maybe we'll jump up, we haven't heard from some of our friends in LA uh, for a few minutes. So maybe if one of the guys will you know, wanna jump in. Luna or Cambry, do you want to come in there? Sort of hopes for the future. Sorry, sorry for the lawn mower in the back. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it or not. But um, we've talked a lot about the peace process, and that's mainly actually been centered on kind of the future generation because it brings this optimism to the conversation. Um, but kind of going back to Northern Ireland, and this is just as an observer. Um, one of the things that was really came up and discussed between um, my peers and I is the schools and the segregation. It was quite shocking to know that 90% of schools are divided between Catholics and Protestants. I think that if you're talking about a future generation that hopefully is coming together, you hope that the schools are also a place to mingle and share ideas because that's where stereotypes and prejudice really break down. Um, so if I had to label one thing that would be a really interesting and important conversation specifically 
for Northern Ireland, it would be schools and education. And how do you involve everyone and break down those borders and lines? That's great. Thank you, Karen. There's great work happening in that space, but you're right, there's, there's so much more we need to do. And Maxwell or Luke or Luna, do, you, do any of you want to come in on sort of hopes of the future? Yeah, I just, I want to mention kind of along the same lines as what Cambria was mentioning. Um, I was really taken back by like Francis. Your research was really surprising to me regarding like how the British politicians just don't really seem to take any interest in Northern Ireland and the conflict that, political conflict that is going on there. So for me, as, as someone that comes from an international background, I think that even I didn't know about the conflict until I took this class. So I think it would be really important to like find ways to have more people that are not just in like in Northern Ireland or in Britain, but like internationally know about the conflict, know about the peace processes and kind of, you know, become more educated on it. Um, I think it's just not as well known as I wish it were. So yeah, just kind of getting the word out there for everyone to know. Thank you, and that's something we, we are not very good at sometimes is celebrating ourselves uh, on the world. And, and, and it's why it's so important that we had President Biden here yesterday to share those experiences. And it's we're the longest running peace agreement in the world. So we have a lot uh, to show uh, many other societies in the world won't have the opportunity or haven't had the opportunity that we've had here. So, you know, you're absolutely right to, to say that. Um, I'll, I'll throw it open a little bit wider. Um, uh, Joel or Tara Grace or Luke or Ellie, Miley, Francis, any of you want to come in? You're in charge right now. What are we going to do? I, I can go um, if it helps. You go for uh, Joel. You can ask me. You asked me a very similar question recently um, and you asked it of myself and Joel and another person called Sean um, about if we could wave the magic wand was actually what you had said, um, which I don't think it's exactly the same as successes, but it's something similar. And I remember I think at the t at my answer at the time was I could sit here and talk about institutional reform. Um, I could sit here and talk about all the nuts and bolts of the agreement, um, but ultimately it was to get back to a sense of goodwill. Um, how could you foster that sense of goodwill and community again? And that to me is what I would really want to see. That's the kind of change, because I think the nuts and bolts, um, integrated education, institutional reform, uh, better services, that, that all has to come from people being willing to look each other in the face in the first place. <laughs> um, and it's, it's how do you get to that point? Um, just, I wanted to respond to that point about, um, how do you make other people internationally aware of the peace process here. I think we actually at times um, hold ourselves back um, from singing our own praises. I think as a culture, uh, there's a sense of embarrassment about talking about the good things that we do. Um, it's almost seen as like, don't be, don't be talking about that. Oh, well, no, no, it's not really that big a deal. It is a big deal. Um, and that other countries, uh, you know, you look at Colombia or you look at sort of the divisions in Israel and Palestine and th those countries look to us as an example of how it can be done better. And actually, I heard a comment from a journalist who worked during the Good Friday Agreement last week who said that as a journalist on the news desk, they expected Israel and Palestine to be sorted out before home. Um, that was that was the conflict that was seen as the easier of the two to fix and that here was the more entrenched. So I think the goodwill that made that happen, I think we need to get back to that. Um, but I think there has to be pressure um, from society here to make that happen. I think that's what the people on this call are kind of trying to do. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I think there's a capturing of a spirit that, that's really come across in this, in this call from each and every one of you. Joel, I think you wanted to come in there. So I'm just... Yeah, well, first of all, there is a million things I'd do if I was in charge <laughs> of the country, so we'll not go through all of them. Um, but I think if we could have a country where everyone has a house, everyone who wants a job has a job, and everyone is fed, we can't be doing that badly. And I think um, step one, Tara, you were asking how we how we get to a point where people have, I would call it enthusiastic goodwill. It's not good enough to just tolerate your neighbours. You should love your neighbours. You should love every one of your neighbours. 
Um, for me, step one has to be we have to understand we're not we're not building off of a baseline here. We're actually building off of a trench. So a lot of people are disenfranchised. They believe that the political process does not work. And it's not a lack of belief. It's a disbelief. It's an act of disbelief. And so I think step one has to be, let's take that, that away so that we're at a baseline and then we can build from there. Um, in terms of showing ourselves off to the world, I don't think that that's that difficult to do, to be honest. There's there's so many good things that go on in our communities all the time. The, the stumbling block that I run into is a real fear and distrust of the media. I have 100 reporters on my phone. I can contact any one of them and have them here tomorrow and uh, to show off anything that we could do. Some of my friends have zero. Some of my friends would not know how to contact a reporter. So I think one of the good ways is, is just maybe access to the media, trying to provide more access to people so that whenever they do want to hold little community events or do hold little festivals or celebrations or whatever, you know, they can call camera crews down and have a little Belfast Telegraph news article put up there. It seems now that the journalists only tend to respond to like bomb threats or the situation and Newton Arts or, you know, our media, and it might not be their fault, you know, because I have had many times where the media have attempted to reach out to people in our communities. And because of that fear and anxiety, it's a no, it's a no, sorry, we don't, we don't deal with the media. So I think that that's a real, a real key point too, because, you know, let's not pretend that we're, we're a country that the people don't care about or the people aren't interested in. We have Joe Biden over here saying that he feels a real strong connection to this place. If we wanted to celebrate things, we will have the eyes of the world on us. All we need to do is is, is kind of shoot some balls and kind of go, well, here are all of the a million things that not only we are now doing, but we also have been doing for the past 25 years as well. It just seems like no one maybe notices the good things at times and the bad things are a lot easier to, well, they're a lot more exciting. They're a lot easier to, to read in a, a news article on a, on a frigging feud between two rivaling drug factions in it and across three towns, you know, that's, that's more exciting to read than our community held an event to celebrate 50 new trees that they planted. You know, there's a guy that goes about, um, round about beaver. He's called the phantom planter. And he, his whole thing is that he just plants trees uh, illegally. He illegally goes about with this mask on and plants trees everywhere. That's amazing. That's something that could drive people here. That's a mystery that we're not capitalizing on. Um, there's so much that we could be doing and, and I think all, all we really need to do is get people out of that trench so that we're at a baseline because once we're at this baseline, I think once we don't need to com uh, compete with um, an anxiety of the media or in a fear of the media, once we don't have to compete with people not knowing or having false assumptions about their neighbours, once we don't need to compete with these things and we're at a baseline, we're actually in a, in a prime position to be maybe even the best place on the planet to live. I agree with that vision, uh, Joel. So thank you very much, as always, for your energy and compassion. I'm conscious of time, and and we could go on probably for another hour at least uh, this evening. Um, and as I say, I think given the the dynamic nature of the conversations, um, I, we we'll have a conversation about a future event to pick up on a lot of this. So see, this is the beginning rather than the end of a conversation. Does anybody else want to jump in with any last minute sort of um, visions or, or hopes for the future? I think Ali Joe's there and and maybe Francis, you put your hand up as well there. Yeah, so we've got Ali Joe Francis and then I'm going to hand back to, um, I think Jennifer Ramos is going to say a few words in closing. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, no, I wanted to kind of jump back on a point that was made um, earlier about like kind of integrated education, just like my kind of upbringing with that. Like I, grew up in an old Catholic old air school um, for secondary school and then um, max primary school, but it was Catholic as well. Um, and to be honest, I didn't meet my first Protestant until I was 16. And for me, how can I say that we live in a peace process if we have that much, had that lack of community cohesion? And I like that wasn't done out of like unwillingness or anything like that, that it was the actual opportunities weren't there and we don't give that enough to young people. So I'm so, so glad these have taken note of that. And like, it is a huge problem that we need to address because 16 is insane. I'm off at university now and I wouldn't even know who is a Protestant now. Uh, but it's just one of those things that I think like we, I, we don't appreciate that as much as we should. And we actually should really focus on that. But I want to say like, if I was to change anything, um, I would really, really address regional inequality. Um, and I know, mm -hmm. Like recently there's been um, violence in Derry and you know, that was really demonised in the media and you know, of course violence is terrible but if we look at the poverty in these areas, I went to school in Craig and I went to the old boys school and the old girls school, I went to school with some of the children out there and do you want to know what, they, they aren't bad characters and I think if you look at it in a way, like I grew up in a very Republican family, my daddy was released under the Good Friday Agreement actually so thankful to be alive in that way but um, 
like I could have been one of those children if I didn't have the opportunities that I was given to get into politics. So there's no difference between me and them. I think they have political opinions there. They're being misdirected right now. And do you know what? It's poverty leading that. So if I were to change anything, I would actually really go back to our roots and say that you know, systematic inequality led us to the economic divides we have now. Let's actually address that rather than make the money that we currently have, but that and also new investments, what we want. To me, it's insane that we don't have like a real specific drive to address it and then we can all be balanced and we can sort today's problem and you don't really sort anything on the back end but um I just want to kind of say that and I don't know if maybe Americans would have heard about that in Gary but I, I was just so disgusted by like the, the kind of the demonization of like these working class communities who largely are ignored there's no investment in our areas but it's very easy to put on a tweet criticizing them um but they're very smart children they have a huge opportunity ahead of them let's just give it to them but that's my contribution. <laughs> I think that's a big issue for the for the United States, uh, where I imagine there's always the argument about which states are getting the money and which cities are getting the money and where it's been spread. So I, I, it's a really important point, and I, I know it's not one that's unique to us, Elijah, but it hopefully we'll show the world how to, to start solving those issues. So I'm I'm con I'm really conscious of time. Francis, did you want to come just a final quick sort of remark, and then I'm going to hand over to Jennifer just to close the session. Yeah, I'll try and be really quick. Um, I don't think this is like my number one thing. I think the integrated education, which everyone has already kind of picked up on, would be my number one thing. But I think the thing that sticks out the most to me is just how shocking the infrastructure is of this place. Trying to get around this country is a nightmare. And I think the fact that the buses in Belfast, I know there's the glider, but like it is what it is, but the buses all go into the city centre, trying to get across, impossible. Um, trains that just like don't exist to about half of the country um the fact that public transport just like cars are seen as the way forward for everyone and that you kind of need them um I think that cuts a lot of communities off from each other and I think also the second half of that is obviously you've got Rishi Sunak standing up and saying Northern Ireland's in this brilliant position to be like have one foot in the British internal market and one foot in the European market and okay, this is a great place to invest money to start a business, but also it's just like the infrastructure needs to be there to go with it to make this a more attractive place to live as well for other people. And in terms of connecting communities and um, breaking those down, down those divisions, also really important. Sure, no, and uh, I see our, our LA friends nodding as well because as somebody who has visited many times and loved every single experience, I, I do know that. I've spent a lot of time in Uber and traffic, though. So uh, again, not a unique problem, but you know, really important to raise and huge issue for for this generation, for our generation to to start to solve. Look, we could continue all evening. This has been really, really fun. I say, genuinely, I feel like a, a shot in the arm of positivity and optimism and hope that your generation represents. And uh, you know, I hope we can continue this conversation another time. Um, and you know, we're delighted that Ellen, you have a long-standing relationship here and bring students nearly every year. To, so we'll, 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 Jennifer, we'll figure out ways to have more of these conversations, both in person and online. But can I, before I hand over, just thank each and every one of you for contributing, for giving your time, but most importantly for, for what you're doing, because as I say, you are already leaders, you're already shaping change, you're already making a difference, both in your communities in LA, here on in Northern Ireland and, and across this island and and we're very very grateful for that so please keep doing what you're doing please keep speaking up and keep making the change that each and every one of you are so Jennifer I'll hand over to you just maybe to say a few words in in closing yeah thanks so much Connor I think this session has been great I just come away with a reaffirmation of what we experienced on our most recent trip to Belfast, which is you all know what to do, you know what needs to be done, and I believe you're going to do it. Like there is so much optimism, and I'm like, so excited that we had you here to share some of your insights with us. I'm so pleased that Connor has been our chair of Irish Studies, our inaugural chair. Thank you so much for your facilitation of these conversations. And I will just, um, uh, let Mara Ford in, uh, my co-teacher for this Irish class, and see if she has a few words too. But thank you again, all of you, and really appreciate your work again. Yes, and just to reiterate what uh, Jennifer said, thank you all for your insights, for your time. Um, 
this uh, conversation was really an excellent conversation. And um, I know I learned things and I, I think, you know, we all learned things from hearing each other's perspectives and what, what um, you know, what, what um, each other shared. I hope this is the first of many conversations. And um, thank you, of course, to Connor for, uh, for your time and for facilitating the conversation. So um, with that, we will, uh, we will close out the webinar. Um, and again, thank you to everyone for your, for your participation.